Welcome to another social distance learning event brought to you by the Liberal Gun Club. Tonight, Scott will be showing us, well, a bunch of different things, mostly related to the civilian marksmanship program. On the bench right there is an M1 Garand or Garand or however you pronounce that. He'll probably tell us the right way. This is currently being streamed out to Zoom, out of Zoom to Twitch, Twitter, and Facebook. Uh, we can't stream to YouTube because YouTube doesn't like it when you handle live firearms during a live stream. Uh, this will be put up on YouTube later, probably after one of our other members decides to edit it and make it look all nice and pretty. Uh, so everyone knows, all participants, but the moderators and presenter have their video shut off and are muted. If there are questions, please put them in the Discord Q&A channel or inside the Zoom chat. We have several people watching for questions at the various locations, uh, but the easiest way to get your questions answered is to become a member, sign into Zoom, and ask your questions here live in chat. Being a member is inexpensive, 10 bucks a year uh, for the least expensive option and brings other benefits with it. One of which is membership in a club affiliated with the Civilian Marksmanship Program, which again, we'll be discussing in a second. We have a Discord. Discord link is in there already, uh, but it's not the one I normally use. So I'm gonna throw the one I put in there and we feel free to join us there for a conversation after uh, the Zoom session. And now to Scott. Take it away. Hey, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are, uh, where I'm at. It's still afternoon. Um, yeah, we, this this is one of these topics that I uh, that was by request. Um, I'm always asking, you know, if there's something that people want to uh, talk about, learn about, take apart, hit with hammers to uh, reach out and let us know. And there was a lot of uh, curiosity about the CMP. And uh, so we decided to kind of go over it, what it is and how to uh, get yourself an M1 Garand. And as Kyle mentioned, it's M1 Garand is the common way we, you know, the, the U.S. troops and people refer to the rifle. But John Garand pronounced his last name Garand, but only the... Uh, there was only a few people refer to the gun as an M1 Garand. So you can say Garand or Garand, you're correct either way. Um, so the CMP is the Civilian Marksmanship Program. And it's a outfit that's, uh, I believe it's financed by the US government, but it's not run by the US government anymore. I think it used to be, but it's been spun off now. And it's really to encourage people to participate in marksmanship activities and, and shooting. And they run uh, competitions uh, year round in, in um, primarily rifle shooting. Um, and uh, they, they have some pretty neat ranges, um, one in, I think, Ohio and one in Florida. I'm, I don't know. I've never, never been there. I never shot any of their competitions. But um, so what they, they do is uh, they used to sell a lot more U.S. surplus rifles um, to the general public. And. So that, that supply line is kind of dried up. So now what's happening is rifles that we sent overseas for like the Lend-Lease program or as aid after World War II in Korea, uh, we sent a bunch to Italy, we sent them to the Philippines, uh, Korea, there's a whole lot of them in Korea right now waiting to come back. But what happens is the CMP makes arrangements, has them shipped to the United States they bring them in house and they have their armorers and gunsmiths completely refurbish them. They take them apart, they replace broken or worn parts, uh, they inspect them and then reassemble them into working rifles. And then they grade them um, from rack grade all the way up to, you know, they have uh, up to like sniper rifles. Um, they pull out, they kind of call the, the the best of the best, if they're special rifles for whatever reason, special designations, they'll pull them out and they're they're available, but they do it through a lottery system and sometimes they uh, auction them off. Um, that, that would be for some really unusual model like the sniper uh, model or something like that. Um, so, and they're gonna run you a pretty penny. 
But the nice thing is that <clears throat> they're reasonably affordable for uh, a Garand. I mean, right now, if you're going to try to find an M1 Garand at, say, a gun show, um, you're looking at $900, $1,000, $1,200 for a lot of the guns aren't really in very good shape. And a lot of them, you don't know what the pedigree of, of them are. The nice thing about the civilian marksmanship program, um, I, I haven't looked at the prices recently, but it, they used to be around $600 on up for rifles. I, and um, that you know that's half the price and you're getting it from an organization that has been through the gun from top to bottom and refurbished it. And if you have any problems with it, they'll make it right. Um, so the CMP is worth the hoops you have to jump through to get an M1 Garand. It, it really is. And I always tell people, you know, before you buy one, go check the CMP and uh, grab one. And right now I checked their website today and they don't have a lot of inventory. I don't think they have any Garand inventory available except the super expensive ones. But that doesn't mean they don't have any guns. What happens is they get so many orders that they get backlogged and they'll shut down the supply. The, they'll get caught up on orders and then they'll post more guns available and you can start ordering again. Uh, and it's usually, you know, probably three to six weeks before they send them out to you after you've requested one. So I thought today I could show you a CMP rifle and then go through all of the requirements that you need to purchase one. And it's not that, not that bad once you get going on it. It just requires a little bit of effort. Um, and it's certainly worth it to get a uh, really good gun. So this is a CMP rifle. Uh, when they ship it to you, if you live in a state, uh, a reasonably gun-friendly state, um, they'll uh, they'll, sh they can ship them to your door. Um, but some States like Oregon, every weapon has, every gun has to go through a transfer process. So they would send it to an FFL here and you'd fill out the 4473. Uh, in some States, you don't have to do that because it's like a CNR gun and they can send it just directly to your house. So you're going to want to check your state laws. They'll know the law before they send you the gun. So, uh, they're not just going to send it to your door if you live in California. They'll, they're very familiar with the various state laws. Um, but it comes in a really nice hard shell case. Shipping is free. They don't charge you additional shipping costs. And it comes in a like a big uh, hard shell case packed with foam. And then it's in that's all inside a cardboard box. So you open it up and you get the gun. I believe you get one um, clip, one uh, end block clip that uh, if you're not familiar with Garands, that's how you load them. It's a, it's a steel clip that holds eight rounds and you push them down into the magazine from the top. So I believe it comes with one of those. And uh, it comes with a certificate of authenticity that tells you that yes, indeed, this gun with this serial number is from the CMP. And then you'll get a uh, piece of paper that has some measurements on it, um, telling you a little bit about the gun. And, and they'll give you the throat erosion, how much the chamber, the chamber throat has eroded, and the crown. They'll tell you how worn the crown is on the barrel. And they're not going to send you something that's just worn out. They're, they're, they replace the barrels, but you know a little bit of wear isn't bad. It's going to, you know, they're, they're, they're made for the military shooting thousands and thousands of rounds. So the chances of you wearing out a slightly worn barrel are pretty slim. Uh, so don't worry about it. If you have a, a throat erosion of say three, that's really not too bad. And there's a special gauge to measure that, that you can order also, I believe through the CMP. Um, so that's, that's what, what you get when you order one. Um, and if you're buying one on the open market, ask to see the, those measurements and a certificate of authenticity if somebody claims that it's a CMP gun. Um, a lot of them have new stocks on them, commercial stocks made after the war. Uh, the really neat ones have the authentic GI stocks that have all kinds of cool 
uh, stampings in the wood. They have inspection marks. They have, um, you know, the Springfield Armory with the, the cannons logo stamped into them. Um, see, they have uh, this one right here. It, it is GI wood, but you'll see there's a square with a P on it. And that's a proof uh, that this gun was proofed. So it was, uh, you know, loaded with higher than normal ammo and check the pressure on it. Um, so, you know, some of those exist. I think they go for a higher premium uh, if they're, they're, you know, really well-marked GI stocks. Be wary of buying stocks with this, the roll marks on them because people forge those all the time. And unless it came from the CMP, there's really no way, or if you have documentation uh, of the history on the rifle, a lot of those roll marks uh, are not authentic that you see on the open market. People fake them all the time. So don't buy a stock that you see. Uh, don't don't buy the story that it's, you know, grandpappy's and it came home from the war with all of the proof marks and roll marks and inspections on it. It's just a story. There's no way to really validate it. Some of these guys go over these things with uh, um, jewelers, loops and things like that. And there are ways to tell the authenticity of them, but um, you really have to know your stuff to be able to do that. Um, so anyway, that's, that's what you get with an M1 Garand. The way you do it is you go out to the CMP website and you can just search for civilian marksmanship program or CMP. It's not hard to find. And uh, I'm going to kind of walk through the requirements that you need to satisfy to get one. Um, so you're going to need proof of U.S. citizenship. So um, you're going to need any official government document, military ID. Um, you know, it needs to show that uh, you're born in the United States or some sort of citizenship. Uh, you know, like a driver's license is a government issued um, ID, a passport, obviously. Um, you're going to but make sure it has your birthday on it and something stating that you're a U.S. citizen. Uh, I think I don't see any requirements. I checked today that there's no requirements for like the real ID yet. So um, you may want to keep that in mind. Uh, proof of age um, needs to be there, but that can go with your government ID. Um, you need membership in a CMP affiliated organization. Uh, and the Liberal Gun Club just happens to be uh, affiliated with the CMP and your membership in the Liberal Gun Club satisfies that requirement. So you would just download a copy of your membership from the uh, uh, LGC's website and send that along with the rest of your documentation. So if you've paid your 10 bucks, you've already satisfied one of the requirements. There are other clubs. Uh, there's a long list of them on their website, things like the Gun Owners of America and oh, uh, Grand Owners Association, which isn't a bad organization to join anyway if you have a grand. There's a lot of really good information out there. Um, and let's see, uh, membership in any of these organizations. Let's see. Okay, it's just all the list of affiliates. Um, okay. So you need to also have proof of um, that you're involved in some sort of marksmanship activity. Um, and the, the list of documents to satisfy that requirement is current or past military service, current or a past law enforcement service, uh, a CMP or NRA, NRA classification card. Uh, so if you shot in a CMP competition or an NRA competition and you got classified, um, which is just, it's sort of like a ranking system. Um, but if you have that, that will satisfy that. Participation in a rifle, pistol, or air gun or shotgun competition. So if you shoot uh, USPS, a or IDP or um, Speed Steel, uh, Steel Challenge, those will satisfy it. You just need your, uh, you know, proof that you are a member of those organizations. And um, I don't think you need to submit any scores or anything. You just need to be able to prove that you did it. Um, and uh, let's there's see. A checklist. There's a checklist you can have folks uh, have them sign for you if you went to it. Um, 
that satisfies that. It's uh, yeah. the form that you you basically hand to the whoever's running the show and they sign it and said you were there and and, and they watched you shoot and you didn't shoot anybody in the face. Yeah. And, also, and uh, sorry. Appleseed, Appleseed yeah. also fills that requirement. There's a document that when you shoot the Appleseed competition or not competition, but the Appleseed class at the end of the class, they'll ask you, do you, are you looking to get a CMP rifle? And if so, here's the documentation. Then they sign it and validate it that you participated. So that's one way to get it. And it's a great way to get it if you don't have it. And we have a video out there talking about the apple seed and what that's like. Uh, some of the other documents, uh, let's see, completion of a marksmanship clinic that included live fire training, provide a copy of the certificate of completion or a statement from the instructor. So that's where like the um, apple seed comes into uh, play here. Uh, if you're a distinguished instructor or coach status, probably somewhere like if you're teaching a, I don't know, a, a, some sort of a gun class at uh, like your local high school has a ski or a trap club. Uh, you can also get those statuses through the NRA and other teaching organizations. I don't believe, oh, well, you could, I, I wonder if being a LGC yeah, instructor. Our, our, our instructors, I believe, count um, because uh, all of our instructors are qualified to go get the RSO certification from them. Oh, so. okay. So yeah. they are indeed friendly to us in that way. Uh, yeah. But, you know, it's easier to have somebody sign sign your little piece of paper saying, yeah, I watched you shoot and you're, you're cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, uh, concealed carry license. Uh, you can submit a copy of that. And I haven't checked, but that may also satisfy your government ID uh, because it's issued by your lo local law enforcement. For me, it's my local sheriff. Uh, I don't know, though. I would I would clarify that with them. Um, but a concealed carry license uh, is nice to have. Um, firearm owner identification cards that included live fire training. Um, so if I don't know if like in Illinois, a FOID card requires live fire, but if you had um, some sort of training that required live fire, then that will work. Uh, if you're an FFL or CNR license. So if you have your type three FFL, that will work. Uh, because you've already been vetted through the federal government to get that in the first place. Uh, com completion of a hunter safety course. So uh, if you took a hunter safety course in your local state, say with your kid, things like that, that will fly. Um, legal eligibility to purchase a firearm. So um, the information you supply on your application will be submitted by the CMP to the FBI National Instant Criminal Background System. So they're running the same check on you that the FFL would. Um, so I think that's why sometimes these can be shipped to your house because the background check has been completed prior to you getting the gun. Um, let's see, a signed and notarized form 2A for each customer will need uh, We'll, uh, let's see, we'll need to be provided for each item purchased. So this is one thing that uh, some people get hung up on. You can download the form from the CMP. All these things are available on their website, but you need to take it in and get it notarized saying you are who you are and a notary signs it and stamps it. And um, uh, so, you know, run to your local bank. A lot of times it's free uh, or I think a lot of like mailboxes, et cetera, and UPS stores also have notaries available for a small fee. Sometimes you're, the company I work for has one, and I just go upstairs to our HR and request the notary service, and they do it for me. Um, so there's also a section here of important state or local requirements. If your state or local Locality requires you to first obtain a certificate, license, permit, or firearm owner ID card in order to possess or receive a rifle. You must enclose a photocopy of your certificate, license, or permit um, with your application. So they're going to know. They, they know the law very well. And so if your state requires it, you're going to need a copy of it. Um, and there's some specific rules here uh, pertaining to local state 
laws like uh, California, Florida, Hawaii, Illinois, you have to be 21 uh, years or older to purchase a rifle. By federal law, you can get one at 18 unless your state law uh, requires 21 or something different. So uh, here in Oregon, it's 18 and the CMP will honor that based on the federal law. Um, Let's see, firearm rifle shipments to California must be made to a state licensed dealer or be made to uh, or be made to individual homes, providing that a California certificate of eligibility and a curio and relic license are provided. Curio and relic license is the type three FFL. Uh, and I would encourage you, especially if you live in California, to get a type three FFL. It's, it's another subject for another day, but it's a simple process. You fill out the application. I think it's 30 bucks for five years or three years. You send it in a few weeks later, you get uh, a copy of the FFL in the mail, and that allows you to buy guns uh, and ship to your house that are 50 years or older. And there's a list of those guns on uh, the, the uh, ATF's website of what's eligible. So anyway, there, there's a few more things on here of uh, local law requirements. I won't read them all off, but uh, some states have different variations of that. Um, let's see. So, and then they also sell ammunition and gun parts and targets and other, they sell other guns, but more in a retail way, like air guns and 22 target rifles and things like that that you can buy off their website, but you have to have kind of have been vetted by them before you can do that. Um, so I don't remember all the qualifications to buy ammo and things like that off their site, uh, but it's certainly worth doing if uh, you're interested because they sell really high quality 22 target ammunition. Uh, they sell a lot of parts for old military guns, 1903s, uh, M1 carbines, M1 garands. Uh, I believe they probably have some 1911 parts out there. Um, so it's, uh, they sell the end block clips that you load these guns with. And that's the best way to get a lot of these parts because they're coming directly from the source and they're not just cheap knockoffs. They're actual parts. I ordered uh, one order of end block clips for $20, I think $23. And it will last me the rest of my life. There's enough of them. Uh, they're reusable and you're going to get enough of them that uh, uh, you won't ever have to buy more rather than you see them at gun shows sometimes for two and $3 a piece, um, which are sometimes $5. People don't really know what they're worth or where to get them. So they, they pay these, you know, exorbitant rates for these things, but the CMP is a really good source for those. Um, they have some additional requirements for shipping ammo and that's going to come down to your state laws. Um, but when you, when you get all this documentation together, um, you, you will fill out a form, uh, and there's two ways to do it. You can download the form, a paper copy of it and fill it out by hand, or you can fill it out online and print it out, uh, however you want to do it. Uh, I don't think every field on the form is able to be filled out online. I think there are a few that you have to fill in by hand. Uh, of course, you're going to have to sign it. Um, so you, you get all your documentation together, you fill out that form, you get your notarization done, uh, and then you submit that to the CMP. You put it all in an envelope and send it off. What some people do is they put a post-it note on there saying, hey, I would, pref I would really like to get a World War II era gun. Um, and the CMP doesn't have to honor that. Uh, they may not, but I've heard of a lot of people having success with that. You have a higher likelihood of getting a World War II gun just because more were produced for World War II. You may get one that was produced uh, after the war for Korea. Um, but, you know, if you wanted something like that, you some people request specific manufacturers because these guns were uh, made by Springfield. They were made by... Um, Oh, Harrison and Richardson, International Harvester. So some people that collect these things want a specific 
uh, rifle made by a specific maker because they're trying to collect the whole set. Um, so they may or may not honor that, but it's worth a try if you have a really strong desire to get, um, you know, a particular type of rifle. You know, it doesn't hurt to write it on a post-it note uh, and stick it to your application. Some people request GI wood, you know, and they'll say, hey, I don't care how beat up the stock is. I want a real GI stock. Um, so, you know, it doesn't hurt to list those things. Uh, I can't, you know, nobody's going to guarantee the success of it, but uh, I have heard people having good luck with that. Um, and then once you send that in, um, they're going to cash your check and it's usually shipped within two weeks of when your check is cashed or your credit card is charged. Um, and they'll just ship it right out and it comes to your door. Um, so I highly recommend if you want an M1 Garand to pick one up. They used to sell back in the old days uh, M1 carbines as well. And that was pretty neat. Those were really neat guns, but those dried up pretty fast. They do have some 1911s available, but they do that on a lottery system. So they'll announce, um, you know, I, I think in the spring, maybe it's summer, they'll say, hey, we have 2,000 1911s, you know, they're, and they're USGI 1911s. They're, they're guns that were, that served. Uh, and now that, they don't use them anymore. They're, there's likely to be a lot of them. Um, and they refurbish them. And I've seen a couple of them. I think, Kyle, don't you own one? Yes, Somebody... that's correct. It's a slightly, well, we have several LGC members that have gone yeah. uh, out to the CMP and tried to get us uh, a 1911. And a few of us have received one. I know yeah. that we've seen an Ithaca from one of our members who I can see just commented in chat. Um, we also have another one out in California that received a Remington Rand, and the one that I received was a 1944 Remington Rand that oh, still dude. shoots probably better than me. Yeah, and the, the cool thing about them, when they first announced that they were going to do this, there were a lot of people speculating that these things were just going to be beaten to death and you know destroyed and you know, horrible finishes. And that turned out not to be the case. All of the ones that I have seen look really nice, you know, and of course they're, they're hundred year old guns. Some of them are going to have some wear on them, but they don't look like they were dragged behind a tank for days. They look pretty nice. I don't know if they refinish them. Do they reparkerize those things? It depends on which one you get. It's really luck of the draw. Some yeah. of them, um, I know I don't remember what grade is which, but there's the three grades in the lowest level. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people were saying that if you pick the, the lowest grade, you were more likely to get numbers matching with original parts and whatnot because it hadn't been refinished, because it hadn't been redone to look nicer, uh, which yeah. is one of the reasons why I did that. And I still ended up with a non-matching slide, but I'm not complaining. Yeah. One of the things I wanted to point out, though, Scott, before you take back over, is that the 1911 raffle program separate from the CMP uh, rifle program. So I had to submit paperwork to get on the roster for a 1911 to be a part of the raffle, but I had to submit a completely different packet with roughly the same information uh, to do the rest of the CMP with regards to uh, Garands, with regards to ammo and all those parts and everything else that you mentioned earlier. Yeah, uh, certainly worth the effort if you really uh, want to own uh, a GI um, U.S. property 1911. That's I recommend you do it that way because you know what you're getting. You're getting a gun that's been re -ar Most of the guns you're going to get anyway have been re-arsenaled at some point in their career. Uh, and so now you're getting one from a source that you know, they know what they're doing. And, and building a 1911 isn't like an AR-15 where you just get Lego parts and put them together. There's a lot of hand fitting involved to get them to run properly. And, and um, you know, there are a lot of in parts interchangeability, but there's still a lot of hand fitting that has to be done on them. So they're the source to get them from. Uh, the price on those is about what, it's a little less than retail, I think, uh, for a USGI 1911. Um, uh, but I certainly recommend that you do it. It's, you know, it's a, say a thousand dollars for a, a nice USGI 1911. You're not going to lose money on it. It's always going to be worth that. 
Um, so those are also, they have, they come available. I think once a year they run that lottery. Um, so you might sign up to be notified when, uh, those are available. I think they just finished the submission process. Uh, every year I keep saying, I'm going to throw in a, a packet and enter my name in the raffle, but I haven't done it yet. Uh, so Anyway, that's that's kind of the offerings of the CMP. Uh, go out to their website, take a look around, look through all of the parts, look through the ammunition. Sometimes they have 30 out six ammunition. They'll have 308 ammunition, 223. They have uh, there are great their their prices aren't you know you're not going to get a screaming deal on surplus 30 out six, but what you will get is some good quality 30 out six ammo uh, for a reasonable price. They're not gouging you for the stuff. But if you need a barrel or an op rod or something like that for the Garand, that's the place to get them uh, rather than off some guy's uh, table at a gun show. So um, that pretty much wraps it up for the CMP. I, I'm sure a few people probably have questions. Um, if if uh, they we we have not gotten any questions yet. We've gotten a few comments. Uh, just a reminder, if you guys have any questions, you can uh, drop them in the Zoom chat or Discord or Facebook, and we'll relay them back. Um, One of the things I wanted to mention, because we touched on it briefly with regards to the 1911s, is that it's a one and done with regards to their program. If you happen to uh, have your name called up with a random number generator and you buy one, that's it. You don't get another one. You don't get the chance to buy one at auction. And likewise, if you buy one at auction and then you had already signed up for a random number, uh, if your random number gets called, they discard it. You only get the option to buy one CMP 1911 from them. Yeah, and the CMP used to limit rifle sales. I don't think they do anymore. It used to be like two in your lifetime, uh, but I think they lifted that restriction but they will um, cut you off if they catch you buying and reselling them. They don't want you to, you know, and, but guys do it all the time. If you go to a gun show, I'd say 80% of the grands you see are CMP rifles that these guys buy and they take a six, $700 rifle and flip it for a thousand dollars because people don't know this program exists and they just have their heart set on getting a, a grand. But if they catch you doing it, they'll uh, cut you off. Um, so it's, it's uh, you know, you got to be careful there. Uh, but I don't think there's a limit to how many you can buy. Uh, you look at the form and, you know, there's a slot to fill in uh, multiple purchases, multiple, uh, part, or, you know, uh, numbers. And the, the, the categories for each of these rifles is numbered. Um, so when you look at their inventory, um, they're grouped, they have a, a number on them and you put that number in, that's what you want to buy. And then you put the total down and blah, blah, blah. But, um, so yeah, you're not, you can buy two of them. I think if you want at the same time. So there are a couple other questions here, Scott. Uh, okay. One of them was, uh, concerned with marksmanship training. Can they get certification from club ranges? Are you aware? Uh, I honestly don't know. Probably if it's a sanctioned organization. Yeah, if it's um, an affiliate club. I mean, that's how we did it the first year that we handed out those little letters. Yeah. Is we were an affiliated club, so we ran a shooting event. We there's a checklist that we filled out, I, which I think is still extant, where we said you didn't shoot yourself in the face and you behaved appropriately. And actually, it's a little more. I, I, yeah. I'm being sarcastic. It's like we we have to certify that you know how to handle a firearm and yeah. that you did it safely and appropriately and uh and then one of our instructors signed at the bottom yeah uh but when we signed up as a club we named a group of instructors and it had to be somebody on that list so as we increase our instructor portfolio and program uh you know eric or i or david <laughs> will go in and keep adding people to that list so that they can sign those pieces of paper but it's got to be that positive verification that you're safe um and that you'll do it right and but that's that's what being part of a member organization like us or like your local range and many or if not most local ranges do go through the trouble of getting cmp affiliated because it's not that hard so it's not that big of a trouble 
but yeah, a lot of local ranges are CMP clubs. Yeah. And the way I recommend people do it, if you really want some good quality training is just take an apple seed class. They're inexpensive and you'll learn a lot and uh, it satisfies that requirement. You know, it's, it's a two day commitment, but it's well worth the, uh, the price and the effort to do it. Um, I saw a question on there that um, somebody's asking if the M1A, how does it compare to the M1 Grand? Well, they're two different things, really. The M1A made by Springfield today is a commercial rifle that's essentially a civilian version of the M14. Uh, so it's it looks a lot like an M1 Garand, but it takes a you know a magazine. Uh, the M1 Garand does not have you know it has an internal magazine that's not detachable and it only takes eight rounds, but you can add you know 20 round mags to a M1A. And so they're, they, they look very similar, but they're really not the same thing. Um, I think that the, the new M1As from Springfield are pretty good guns, as, as good as an M14 is. Uh, we all have strong Yeah, I opinion. might argue that point. Yeah. Well, we all have <laughs> strong have opinions think... about the M14 and the accuracy and efficacy. Well, of no, guns. no. My, my thing is, is that Springfield's machining has been somewhat less than great. Uh, so you want to be careful. With the Springfield, they'll 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 tell you you can send it back and they'll fix whatever the problem is. But um, Springfield's quality, when it comes to the more recent M1A ones, are is not as good. Uh, the M14 is a very very similar rifle. Um, the takedown is identical. Uh, the parts are identical. Uh, it's just the differences is that uh, they were a mil spec uh, for for uh, combat action. And the M1, the M1A ones are just a, a commercially available, um, I, I call it a clone. Yeah. So the, the major difference, though, between besides the ones that Scott has mentioned so far is that the M1A is chambered in 308 and or 65 Creedmoor now. And most of the Garands are chambered in 30 out six. So that's yeah. a, a big difference between the two. And I'm glad you brought that up because you there are. CMP M1 Garands that come in 308, um, and they take a slightly different M block clip, or or you know it's slightly different uh, to be able to load them. They take the M block clip, but the 308 is a shorter round. So uh, you know I don't know if you can specify. I don't recall because there, when I did it, you didn't have the choice, or they I don't remember there being any 308 rifles at that time, but. So, you, you know, just be where I mean, neither one's not better than the other in my book. I mean, it, it's natively was built to shoot the 30 out six. But, you know, if it was rebarreled and, and made to shoot 308, that's great because there's a lot. There's more and more 308 surplus ammo now than there is 30 out six. That stuff's drying up a little bit. Um, and you and 308 is a great round and it's ballistically fairly similar. So I wouldn't be too discouraged if you got a 308 instead of a 30 out six. But yeah, just be mindful that that's a possibility. Getting away from the M1A and the Garand comparisons, uh, someone asked if there was anyone available in New Mexico. And other than Appleseed, we do have instructors across the country. We recommend reaching out on the LGC website to find an, uh, an instructor specific to your area. And I'll throw a link in the chat here so that you uh, have that available to you. Uh, it looks like somebody commented that the 308 Garands are a separate item. Yeah, I wasn't sure how they handled that, but um, certainly, you know, if, if it's an option available to you, I, I don't see any anything wrong with getting a 308 versus a 30-06. I like the 30-06 because that's the way John Garand specified them. And, you know, I like surplus rifles kind of in their original, uh, configuration um so you know it's up to you though uh, some people don't mind modifying these things or you know but if you do please don't tell me about it i don't want to know i don't want to you know and, it, and you know yes you can mount scopes and all kinds of things to these but if you're going to do that um don't tell me it makes me cry um buy a m1a and do it to that. Those guns are, are you know, better equipped to do that. Um, 
I'm going to interrupt you for a second there, Scott, because someone asked if the LGC provides individual membership cards. Uh, since you're in the Zoom, you are a member, uh, you should be able to go to the membership portal on the LGC website, and there is a place where you can print out your membership card. Yeah, just go to your account. Where, you know, where... To clarify, the portal is membership.theliberalgunclub.com. Yes, Ed put it in the chat for those of you. Now you can click it. Yeah, but they don't it's, mail it's, out a card. Like, to... Yeah, they yeah don't we, don't mail, we don't mail out cards anymore. I got yeah. prohibitively expensive and a little silly because there's thousands of you people and we're all volunteers. That said, that's the reason that all the cards have an expiration date of October, regardless of whether or not you just joined, uh, is the CMP wanted us to have expiration dates on the cards. So everybody's card expires in October, even if you just joined in September, but we roll those dates forward. Uh, and your actual uh, sign-in date is your is your expiration date. So that's a question we get an awful lot. But the reason it's there is for this express purpose. Yeah, yeah. And you can just yeah, you can just. I think it's a PDF file. You can just download and print it out, and it has the front and back images of, of what would be your membership card, and that will suffice. See. Does anyone else have any additional questions while we're uh, wrapping up things here? Because I don't believe we have any additional ones. It's, uh, I strongly encourage you to do it when there's rifles available. If you have any desire to own a M1 Garand, that's to me the way to get them. Uh, I really I cringe when people go to a gun show and buy one off a table. You know, they're, they're paying double for what they could have done themselves with a little bit of paperwork and a little bit of effort. Save the, save the 600 bucks and buy ammo and a sling and, you know, have fun. Oh, and bayonets are readily available for these things too. The, the original World War II bayonets are getting expensive, but the Korean War era bayonets are pretty, pretty available and, and they work just fine. Okay, well, I don't see any additional questions. So I know you had a preview for the next session, which is not next Tuesday, but I believe the Tuesday after that. Because I know you had yeah. it on the bench earlier. So we, we tend to hop around. Um, we got, I kind of got uh, harassed a little bit by always just talking about old guns uh, because I love them. I have quite a few of old collectible and not so collectible guns. Uh, so we're trying to mix in modern uh, guns as well. And I just picked this up uh, and thought, why not talk about these? This is a uh, Scorpion EV, uh, uh, Evo 3. And this is the pistol configuration, but they make them in a carbine configuration as well. Uh, the only difference is, of course, the barrel length. And then this one has been SBR'd, so the stock is legal on this. Um, but anyway, we'll talk about kind of all of that stuff if you're interested in the uh, CZ Scorpion. And I'll talk about some of the upgrades that you'll want to consider if you are interested in one of these and kind of how to take it apart and how to do those upgrades. So next time will be the CZ Scorpions. One uh, one last question kind of popped up. Uh, uh, the cost generally for a rack for lesser grade um, mm, uh, M1 Garand. It's gone up a lot in the last few years. They used to be around 600, but I think they're now around seven for a rack grade. And, you know, a rack grade isn't going to be a pristine example, but some of them are pretty darn nice. And it's kind of hard to tell between uh, service grade and rack grade on. Uh, some of those rifles. So you're not going to go wrong with a service grade. It might have a little bit less uh, desirable stock on it, or, you know, some, the parkerization might not be all that great, but it will be a really good serviceable rifle for 700 bucks. So most of them are sold out at the moment. If yeah. you're looking at an yeah. expert, well, I'm looking at the site right now. Uh, yeah. Looking at an expert grade M1 Garand, it's a thousand dollars. Um, yeah. There are some other ones that are more specialized, like a partially refinished one for 750. If I'm reading right. partially refurbished, sorry. Um, so you'll want to grab that link and check it regularly. 
uh, to see if they have something that's within your price range and that's something that you'd like. Yeah, and also there are two CMP stores, uh, I believe in Ohio and I think Florida, and you can buy them there. They have them out there on the floor. They have some 1903 Springfields. Um, they have all kinds of stuff in there. You're going to have to go through the same hoops. So if you're if you're going to be in Ohio and you want to visit the CMP store, bring all your documentation with you. And you can buy one right there off the floor and bring it home with you. So that's another option available to you. And if you go out to the CMP, there's some forums out there. There's one forum that uh, people will visit that store regularly and they'll tell you what's in stock on any given day. They'll tell you, oh, I saw 15 M1s, you know, on the rack and I saw three, oh, three Springfields. So, you know, it's another thing to consider if you live in the area where those places exist.